Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor for episode 96. Thanks very much for tuning in on these hot summers that we're having now here in early part of July. I've got a few stories that I'm going to talk about today, uh, so let me get right to it. First story deals about charging, and everybody who lives in the U.S. is familiar with the Electrify America charging network. They've been going at it for some time now, and they've made a couple of good announcements. Even with the COVID-19 delays, they've been able to complete um, the first of two cross-country routes for EV charging. Um, the second one is to be uh, uh, finished by September, October-ish. And these routes will enable EV drivers to drive across the U.S. from coast to coast. Now, of course, what's going on right now in the U.S., I may, I wouldn't recommend going to visit people. But as things uh, become back to normal at some period of time, uh, these routes will be there. These are high-speed DC fast chargers. And the first route that's now complete it runs along Interstate 15 and 70. It covers 11 states for a total of 2,700 miles. Uh, you can drive from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. or Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles, depending on what your choice of route is. Um, the DC fast chargers deliver up to 350 kilowatts. So these are newer stations with 50 kilowatts being the minimum power output that they provide. They're typically situated about 70 miles apart. So for most EVs that are out there, anything that has a significant battery of 40 kilowatts or even, even the Ionics and some of the e-golfs that have in the 30s, uh, this is more than enough range to get you from station to station if you want to do a long, a long commute. So pretty good for a network that's only been around for about 25 months, so just over two years. And now they have over 430 sites with uh, over 1,900 individual charging stations. Uh, and they have 100 more sites that are currently in development, which will add another 400 charging stations. So pretty good and nice to see more charging environment, especially in the U.S., where EV adoption can really, really speed up uh, now that there's more infrastructure. A bit of history that occurred for VW at the end of June. Um, after 116 years of operation, the plant in Zwickau no longer produces any internal combustion vehicles. Let that sink in. Over 100 years of operation and they've stopped producing their, their internal combustion engine vehicles finally. Now everything is going to be all electric coming out of that plant. It's a pretty big deal when you peel back the layers of this for VW. Um, this plant for VW has produced over 9.5 million vehicles since 1990, since VW Group took it over. Um, including 6 million uh, Volkswagens out of that. It started actually, as I mentioned, in 1904 with the production of the Horsch car. Over 33,000 units from 1904 to 1940 were produced, and then uh, various other uh, manufacturers uh, used the plant for production, including Audi, DKW, IFA, and then uh, uh, the, the P series. Not sure who did that. And then uh, Trabant, and finally Volkswagen Group uh, from 1990 onwards. A uh, pretty big deal again. Now, Volkswagen continues to invest money into this plant for retooling and transformation of it to produce the all-electric platforms. They earmarked another 1.2 billion euros for that. Um, now, this plant will will produce three of the VW Group brands from a Volkswagen, Audi, and Seat. They'll all be produced there, of course, on the MEB platform. Total output is uh, going to be ramped up to 330 cars a year. Right now, they're still slowly ramping up uh, the pr production of the ID3. So anyway, it's a pretty historic moment for VW. And for those naysayers that keep saying that VW is all about just publicizing stuff and not doing anything, there's a lot of stuff that they've been doing. So I hope you kind of start looking at VW from a different aspect. Dieselgate, leave it alone. It's gone. It's in the past. Let's move forward, folks. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's help them accelerate EV adoption by watching and promoting what they do because they are doing a lot towards that. Now, staying with VW, they did announce that they're not going to produce the ID buggy, that uh, pretty cute concept that came out uh, about a, well, a year or so ago. Um, now, part of the reason is because they were going to use the MEB platform as the underpinnings for this, but the actual chassis and the body and the internals, the interior were all going to be uh, co-produced by a company called eGo Mobile. 
but unfortunately that company is having financial problems and it's into solvency issues now at this point of time so because VW really only does mass production it doesn't make sense financially for for them to fully produce a very limited a small vehicle line or vehicle brand because they don't expect a lot of these to sell it's a very niche vehicle that's why they're going to partner with the platform and outsource it to Eagle Mobile to produce the actual finished production of the vehicles um, but unfortunately that's not going to happen so unless they can find another part to do that it doesn't look like the we'll see the e buggy or the ID buggy anytime soon too bad it's a cool looking vehicle i wouldn't get one but you know there are folks out there that like him but again it's a very small niche market so uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens and one last article from vw i typically don't follow a lot of the plug-in hybrid vehicle markets but they did make an announcement that they've refreshed their um Arteon, uh, or Ardeon uh, vehicle as a plug-in hybrid. This is the first time it's being offered that for the 2021 model year. It's a mid-life cycle makeover. It is available as a wagon, um, and as I mentioned, it'll be available as a plug-in hybrid. Now, this is strictly for the European market. We won't see that this in North America, which is too bad because wagons are pretty big in Canada. Not sure about the US, so they like the SUVs more, but wagons have always been fairly popular here. Now, there's no specifics for the plug-in hybrid powertrain, but we suspect, uh, or the article suspects, that it's the same one that's offered in the current Passat GTE, which is 156 horsepower, 1.4 liter turbocharged, four-cylinder with 115 horsepower electric motor, so a combined output of over 200 horse and 400 uh, newton meters, 295 pound-feet of torque, so pretty decent. Um, the key here for the plug-in aspect is it's got a 13 kilowatt battery, a little small for my liking, and uh, the estimated EPA range on this is about 56 kilometers or about 35 miles in battery only, electric only mode. Good to see though Volkswagen adding electrification to more of its model lineup. Now, a company that I've been following for quite a while, Byton, unfortunately, is having some problems, and it looks like they may not make it through the pandemic uh, uh, in a positive manner. Byton is probably on the brink of collapse. According to the company, it's uh, ceased operations starting uh, as of uh, for the for half of the year, as of the remaining half of the year, as of July 1st. Um, whether it'll continue into 2021 remains a mystery. Probably not. Uh, Byton has laid off almost all of its employees now worldwide. Um, and it was too bad because they did get a third round of funding in January. And they had over 60,000 pre-orders in the early part of this year for the m -Byte that were placed. Um, it was to be launched in China this year initially as the opening market for the m -Byte, followed by North America and Europe next year in 2021. Um, and that pre-orders were to open for North America in the second half of this year. Unfortunately, that doesn't look like it's going to happen. So keep your eye on Byton if you have a reservation. I don't know what's going to happen with that. I would reach out to the company and find out if, you know, if what their cancellation policy, it may be, it may be fully cancelable. I haven't looked into it, but if uh, a word from the wise, if you are, if you do have a reservation and you're not sure, I would probably cancel the reservation, get your money while you can, because if they declare bankruptcy and, and file for that for protection, then it's going to be really hard to get any money back from them. So, Anyway, too bad, uh, but it just means that some of the other players that are continuing on need to step up and uh, continue pushing EVs. Now, for those who have followed the channel, you know that I love pushing affordability when it comes to EVs, because to me, that's the number one barrier for adoption right now. It's not infrastructure. It's not safety. It's not uh, less emissions is not any of that people people understand what EVs provide from that it's cost it's upfront cost and I love to hear stories like from India which is a huge market um, so it's nice to see more product come to the market there and to be affordable because it is a different economy there so Tata is taking the Nexon product line and electrifying it so they're not coming with a ground up vehicle a ground designed up EV it's taking an existing chassis and platform that works and electrifying it and we've seen that work quite well in the Kias in the Hyundai's 
Um, those products are excellent, excellent EVs. You don't necessarily need to build something from the ground up. There are advantages to doing that, but you don't have to to provide a good product. A lot of people think you do. That's not the case. So they're converting, as I mentioned, the Nexon Compact SUV. It's a great looking vehicle and reducing the costs. So they've come out with uh, statements that it's going to cost about $18,000. And I, this is a US article, so I'm, I'm assuming that this is US pricing. You'll have to convert it to local currency, but that sounds pretty affordable to me. And then you add on some incentives. The Indian government has launched a package of incentives, including the FAME subsidy, uh, which is based on the size of the battery so you get so many dollars off the size of the battery and on the Nexon that could equate to about 3900 bucks because it has just over a 30 kilowatt hour battery pack so that could reduce the entry price to that to $14,000 US you know you're seeing the pictures here folks this is a nice looking uh, EV and even a 30 kilowatt battery um, that's nothing to sneeze at that's going to be a decent size it gives you about 300 or so kilometers 194 miles of range then now that's using India's um, ARAI certification program which I doubt that that's anything close to real life I, I'm seeing numbers around the 110 to 135 mile range so you can convert that to kilometers to make sense but you know even at 110 to 135 miles that's similar to what uh, the mini cooper se uh, all, all electric is providing and the honda e and they have slightly bigger battery packs and they're much much more expensive i believe double the price so if if tata can do this and come out with that price point and then you look at the incentives boy this thing could really really be popular now no indication if this is going to be available outside the indian marketplace i doubt it but again, it's nice to see that automakers are working towards affordability uh, in EVs. And this could be another first step along with what VW is doing on the MBB platform and others to bringing that price point down to EVs to make it more affordable to help spur on EV adoption. Now, I may have covered Lordstown Motors before. Um, they have a plant, actually, they have a plant in Ohio, excuse me, to. Uh, uh, to build an all-electric pickup truck uh, called the Endurance. Uh, they've been basically a lot of renderings for the last year or so, so I haven't really paid too much attention, but they have come out with a prototype finally now, a pre-production prototype by the looks of it. Um, so at least they're getting closer. They're making some forward progress and moving this forward. Now, uh, again, they're capitalizing on what Rivian has come out with of putting a motor on each wheel to, to give a combined output of over 447 kilowatts, um, starting at a price point of about 52,500 US dollars. Um, there's not a lot of other specs. They do intend to assemble this in the, their Ohio plant. Um, again, the prototype was showed off recently, and it looks pretty close to what the drawings and the renderings uh, we've seen for that. Estimated range, no, no updates on that, but it still is pegged to be about 250 miles or 400 kilometers, so decent range for a large pickup truck like that. That's according to EPA. Nothing, uh, nothing more about the energy density of the batteries and the sizes. They may come out with multiple sizes like Rivian. We'll have to wait and see. Um, and the towing and all this kind of stuff hasn't really been announced. Production is scheduled to start next year with uh, Lordstown Motors aiming to produce only about 20,000 of these uh, uh, in 2021. So it's not going to be a very large number, a very niche market for that. But they have over 14,000 uh, orders, pre-orders already for place. So even for renderings, people are putting down money. Go figure. Oh, well. Uh, anyway, if anybody's got one in order and they're hearing stuff about this, uh, keep me informed because I'd love to track this. And I really hope they are successful of, of bringing this to market. Final story today is from Opel in Europe. They have unveiled a new electric vehicle called the Mocha Electric, and it's their first model. That's going to be an all-electric version right from the start. So it looks like it's a brand new uh, ground-up model from them, and it is based on the drivetrain from the PSA Group's ECMP platform. And if you I think watch a couple of shows ago, I went through some of that. Um, that's the same platform used on the Peugeot E200, uh, E2008, excuse me, and the Corsa E, uh, two very, very fine vehicles in Europe. Um, all kinds of specs on that. You can look it up. WLTP ranges of about 322 kilometers or so um, for a 50 kilowatt hour size battery. That seems to be a nice entry point. 
um, support up to 100 kilowatt DC fast charging. No pricing yet, and you can start ordering, placing orders right now. The timeline is for uh, being able to accept orders for the summer of 2021 with shipping shipments in the later part of next year. So wait and see for those in Europe. And if you uh, have any more news to send me, please do. If you are on a waiting list, I'd love to hear from you. But it's a nice looking vehicle. And uh, again, nice compact sizes for the European markets. All right, and that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show. Thank you very much for tuning in, taking some time to watch me as I help to educate minds one tailpipe at a time. Always appreciate everybody with their comments on YouTube. If you have not subscribed, please do. I won't hound you with emails if you do. You can also press the bell and be notified when there's a new episode launch. It makes a big difference to get those subscriptions up and I would love if you did. Thank you everybody that does comment, likes and dislikes and all that good stuff. Of course, always a humble thanks to my Patreon supporters. Uh, very much helps every month to uh, see that support come in and to help me continue to do the shows. Hopefully everybody enjoyed the Model Y review in the last episode. That was a lot of fun doing that. So again, thanks for Patreon. If you're not sure what it is, go check out the website. And even a dollar a month helps. goes a long way. Um, I believe that's it. I also, again, want to encourage everybody to stay safe, you know, especially my U.S. viewers. You know, it's it's. I watch the news and it's just heart-wrenching to see what's going on. As And if you're not taking this coronavirus seriously, you really need to because it is a serious, serious element. And it's the proof now is out there for the states and for the areas of the regions, not just the U.S., but around the world that have come out of this too quickly. And we're seeing the repercussions with some of the numbers go up. And this, this is a very serious... Uh, disease so please stay safe follow your local guidelines and if you're you know again if you don't think it's safe then don't don't do it and wear a mask uh, whether you know I mean I had this conversation this morning about masks with somebody and we're having this people are arguing about it here you know it's, it's against constitutional rights in Canada and all this kind of stuff and I'm thinking well if you're out working in a lumber yard and you're handling wood would you not wear gloves so you don't get splinters and cut your hand if you're not sawing wood or cutting uh, cutting metal, would you not wear eye protection? If you're not working around loud machinery, would you not wear ear protection or a helmet on a construction site? Those are not anti uh, against constitutional, unconstitutional folks. I don't see the difference in a mask. This is something that could help, could. It's, a, it's not a for sure. You need to do all the other measures, but it's a small thing that does provide a lot of benefits. So hopefully maybe that helps sway your mind because I'm walking, we went out yesterday, there's a lot of people not wearing masks in, in stores, like in, in malls and stuff. So uh, please uh, adhere to this. Let's keep everybody safe. And until the next show, I'll get off the soapbox now. I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you very much for tuning in. Appreciate all the support, emails, comments, all that stuff. Please keep them, please keep them coming in. I love to get emails, by the way. So please don't hesitate to send me something. All the contact information is coming up at the end of the show. Until the next show, please, everybody stay safe. And I'll see you when I see you. Bye-bye.